Hello, and welcome to this Lunch and Learn brought to you by the ASGCT Patient Education Committee. Today's session, Meet the Researchers, offers an opportunity to learn more about what gene and cell therapy researchers do in the lab and how they work with various patient organizations and other stakeholders to further their findings. My name is Sharon King, and I'm the Advocacy and Community Engagement Manager at Aldevron. I'm also a member of the ASGCT Patient Outreach Committee. Meet the Researchers is the eighth session in the Lunch and Learn series. We've covered many different topics over 2022 that were intended to build on one another. And we've had over 1,000 registered attendees from industry, nonprofit organizations, patients, caregivers, and others. All of the previous sessions are available to watch on demand at patienteducation.asgct.org. And these recordings have captured over 12,000 views. The site also contains a library of offerings, including Gene Therapy 101 and disease-specific content that's free for all to access, and we encourage you to share it widely. The first ever unit of Gene Therapy Basics was recently updated, so please check out this resource after the session. Today, we'll have the pleasure of hearing from three researchers working in the field of gene and cell therapy, Dr. Rachel Bailey, Dr. Nicholas Wynn, and Dr. Julia Grishik. We'll follow up their presentations with a Q&A, so please continue to submit questions in the chat throughout the session for the discussion that will follow. I'm going to keep my introductions brief today, so our speakers will be sharing most of their information during their presentation. To begin the discussion, we'll have Dr. Rachel Bailey. Dr. Bailey is an assistant professor at UT Southwestern Medical University and is the current chair of the Patient Outreach Committee at ASGCT. Dr. Bailey, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon, so much for that introduction. That was fantastic. Um, as Sharon mentioned, my name is Rachel Bailey, and my lab at UT Southwestern Medical Center focuses on precision medicine for neurological disorders. So for our research, we actually focus on the use of adeno-associated virus, or AAV, to deliver our gene therapies to the brain. And we use AAV because it's easy for us to engineer. It's been shown to be very good at targeting brain cells and has a very good safety profile. So what my lab specifically focuses on is engineering these AAV vectors to deliver gene therapies. And we do this for multiple disorders. And um, some of our focus is gene replacement for single gene disorders. So these are oftentimes rare pediatric disorders for which there are no other treatments. And below I've listed several diseases that my lab works on. And many of these actually began um, as a postdoc for me when I was in the lab of Dr. Stephen Gray at UNC Chapel Hill. And others we have recently begun at UT Southwestern in my own lab. So studying these monogenetic or single gene disorders, we can learn a lot from them, um, both in the lab as well as when they go to clinical trials. So using that information, we can then apply it to more complex diseases. So my lab also works on gene modification for neurodegenerative disorders. And we focus on a group of tauopathies um, as well as some frontal temporal dementia. And finally, we always need to look to improve how gene therapies work. So my group also works on precision targeting of gene therapy delivery. So I've shown here the translational roadmap because I, myself and my lab are basic scientists. So in the purple box, you can see how research starts for gene therapies, where it begins with designing our vectors, doing preclinical studies to look at expression, safety, and efficacy. And if all of those are promising, we then engage with regulatory agencies, such as the FDA, to get guidance on starting a phase one clinical trial. And then with that guidance, we can prepare for clinical trials obtain regulatory approvals, and then move into a phase one. So although myself and my lab are at the basic science side on the left side, 
we work with many clinicians, foundation, and industry sponsors to help move um, our gene therapies along this pipeline in hopes of getting them to a phase one clinical trial. So I wanted to show this as science takes a village. So as I mentioned, we do collaborate extensively with many different scientists, both at UT Southwestern, as well as at other medical institutions, as well as with clinicians who are seeing the patients. And this is to better inform and to design and make better therapies for the patients. And then I have a little um, montage, I guess, of pictures from my own research lab because it takes a lot of skilled scientists and technicians to be able to do this work and to pass it on. And so I've been fortunate to work with a great group of people. And also to get these projects from conception to the bedside, we have to work with many partners. So for the rare pediatric disorders, as well as for age-related neurodegenerative disorders, we do work closely with patient foundations. And oftentimes these projects begin because of those foundations where they are able to provide the funding and the support necessary for us to launch these programs. Um, and then as we are able to show good proof of concept, then we can start to interact with our industry sponsors, um, interact with the NIH and find other ways to help move these treatments forward. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to our discussion. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Bailey. I really love to hear that it, it does take a village um, to move forward these important innovations for patients waiting on the other side. Thank you so much for that. Um, our next speaker sharing more about work, his work in gene and cell therapy is Dr. Nicholas Wynn. Dr. Wynn is, the assistant prof is an assistant professor at the Center for Gene Therapy at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Wynn. Thanks for the kind introduction. So I guess, uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm from France. Uh, did my PhD in a, a beautiful environment, as you can see here, uh, starting working on neuromuscular disorder from diagnosis to understand how some patients were escaping their phenotype and how we use this knowledge to help the other patients that were not that lucky. And so in 2011, I moved to Columbus, Ohio, a quite different landscape, but still a, a very helpful and kind city. Um, um, and I still work on neuromuscular disorder, but switch uh, to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I apply whatever I learned during my uh, PhD studies to help uh, du du patient with Duchenne mutation. So uh, Sharon stay working uh, so in 2016 I opened my lab um, and we're still working on neuromuscular disorder but also expanding to neurological disorder so the center where I work was created by Dr. Jerry Mandel which I'm sure most of you are uh, know him and since 2017 Dr. Flanagan is a director of uh, the center and we have led several clinical trials and several IND, and uh, there is famous st studies, especially uh, co concerning SMA, that um, really brought the field up. So this is just, as we were talking about um, building uh, and having so many people um, being involved in your research. So this is just a sample of my lab and all these um, people that are funding and supporting and helping to move forward this, pro this program. So as I said, I mean, I did my PhD uh, on the neuromuscular that was affecting dysferlin, and I work on gene transfer and exon skipping. Uh, during my postdoc, I work on dystrophin and use my exon skipping background to help a subpopulation of uh, Duchenne patient. And my technical expertise is really around exon skipping, but not the one that most of the people use. It's a vectorized exon skipping. So as we, one of the main topic today is, um, is uh, gene therapy. Uh, we use a vector to deliver basically uh, the technology. And one aspect that is extremely critical for uh, our work in general 
and thanks to the patient is to collect skin biopsy from the patient and convert them into the cell of interest that you want to test the, your therapy. So it's very crucial to, to have uh, a good communication with the patient and to keep reminding them that thank you so much for sharing uh, part of your body. Uh, as I say, I mean, my lab is working on RNA editing and for neuromuscular and neurodegenerative disorder. So one of the topic of today is what does a principal scientist do? And so when I was asked that question, I was like, uh, this is like this. It's basically <laughs> we do very different uh, things. And I tried to come up with some part of it. So we come up with the idea to help the patient or solve basic scientific question. We design the approach. We generate preliminary studies, thanks in, uh, to the lab as well. Uh, we find the support to perform the next step of the experiment. Uh, we write grant and paper. We mentor the people in the lab. We manage administrative du duties such as budget, internal or external administrative duty. We participate on committees, whether it's student, PhD, review grant paper, judging poster, and so on and so on. And we present work at conference and to inter interact with a patient and their family. So that's just a snapshot of uh, what we do on a daily basis, basically. And I'm not going to enter too much into the adeno vi associated virus because um, the previous speaker already mentioned it. I guess what I want to share is we basically replace this natural uh, viral um, component by the therapy that we want to, to deliver. And it's a very good approach because it has almost no integration into the genome, so, so less risk of having um, uh, off-target effect. And so far, it has been very safe in most of the cases. And one of the challenge when we use this type of therapy, and that's going to be my last three slides, uh, is when you think, in my case, of a neuromuscular disorder, we have 600 muscles in the body that we need to target with this approach. And when you think of a neurological disorder, it's also very challenging because, first of all, depending on how you deliver uh, the virus, you might not target that efficiently the brain. And there is so many different cells in the brain that need to be targeted. And just to give you an idea, and uh, just uh, let's focus on the last part of it here. Yeah. Uh, when you think of dosing patient, it's like comparing dosing a patient to uh, the Milky uh, Way, because that's the amount, when you see all this star, that's the amount of virus that we need to deliver to help a patient. So it's very pricely, unfortunately, and also uh, involves some risk. And uh, previous speaker already mentioned that, but just to say it, I mean, there is several phases that we need to go through in order to, um, to be able to uh, treat patient. And the take home message here is it's, it's not that quick, unfortunately. It, it takes several years uh, before we can finally inject a patient. And it's for the good part because we need to run mouse safety study or non-human primate study, safety study to make sure that we are not uh, risking anything in the patient. And with that, I will stop here and Looking forward for the discussion as well. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Wen, and thank you for highlighting the importance of patient communication and and uh, how their contribution is critical to the work that happens in your lab every day. Thanks so much for that. Finishing out our presentations before we start our discussion today, um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Yulia Grishuk. Dr. Grishuk is an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital and a member of the Patient Outreach Committee. Dr. Grishuk, I'll leave it to you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you for having me. And I'm delighted to join um, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Wayne on this panel today. So my laboratory at the Center for Genomic Medicine at MGH is focused on uh, therapy-oriented research of 
ultra rare neurologic disease. Um, and we also, similar to the um, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Wayne, um, use AEV mediated um, gene therapy uh, approach for them. So my, my interest in neurologic disease started in 2007. And when I um, did my postdoctoral training uh, in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland, with Professor Lucy Carter and uh, uh, Professor Clark, and I'm a molecular biologist by my training. So at that time, I was very curious about lysosomes and those are the uh, intracellular organelles. And their role in regulating um, neuronal deaths in acute and uh, chronic neurotoxicity, neurodegeneration. And on a practical level, uh, uh, while we were specializing a lot in both in vivo and in vitro research, my specialty was uh, design and use lentiviral vectors in primary neuronal cultures. In 2010, uh, I relocated to Boston and uh, started my postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Seuss Lagenhop at MGH and uh, grew <laughs> at MGH to assistant professor. But somehow in October uh, 2022, I'm still here. And so what brought me into Seuss lab is the lysosomal disease she worked on. And so it's extremely rare um, disease called uh, mucolipidosis type 4. And uh, there is quite a bit of history of ML4 research at MGH, and I briefly go through this. So uh, uh, um, at her early stages of the career, so she was approached by ML4 Foundation uh, with request to discover a gene, causative gene for this disease. Disease was described in uh, uh, 1976. So in, in 1996, they approached uh, MGH to initiate the, the research project. And so uh, a few years later, in, 2000, in, in uh, 1999, she discovered and published the gene. And so it's an mcol one gene that um, encodes a very important protein for lysosomal function, TRIPML1. And she then went to create a mouse model. So at the time I joined the lab, the mouse was created, but was poorly characterized and the disease was poorly understood. And so I took on this project and spent uh, uh, some, some uh, number of years uh, looking and understanding brain pathology and eye pathology in this mouse model. And uh, this uh, allowed um, us to gradually transition into translational work and therapy oriented work. In 2016, we started testing AEV mediated gene therapy approach in this disease in my lab. And uh, by now, we have generated a very robust and actually striking um, uh, uh, proof of concept efficacy data in this mouse model. And now we are actively working on translating this approach into the first in human clinical trial. So as Dr. Bailey mentioned, and um, this, uh, this is not a solo task, and it takes a village. And so at MGH, uh, I have um, uh, a team uh, work closely with um, pediatric neurologists uh, who uh, lead a natural history program on this disease, and uh, we collaborate to design and move it into the clinical trial. And I also have a team that helps with CMC regulatory guidance, which is also a key element uh, in this process. So to summarize and a little bit kind of generalize the major activities and the major tasks uh, we are doing uh, in the lab. So we take on early preclinical development and testing, so uh, identifying or developing animal model for the disease designing a therapeutic strategy and conducting proof of concept efficacy testing in the uh, animal model. We do uh, um, a biomarker discovery to help uh, translational efforts. And we also uh, an active part and, uh, and participate in developing strategy uh, to enable first in human trials in a rare, ultra rare um, uh, diseases neurologic diseases, this is quite uh, tricky often. So um, 
key element of what we're doing uh, in the lab is work with um, patients, patients advocacy groups. And so it is just impossible to overestimate the role uh, those organiza organizations uh, play. And so my research uh, programs um, uh, in my lab, they simply would not be possible without support of the patients' um, organizations. So we work very closely of, on mucolipidosis type 4 project with ML4 Foundation. This is the only uh, uh, patient um, uh, advocacy group that uh, exists in the uh, world. So they um, not only fund, uh, funded the um, gene discovery, as I mentioned earlier, they found that preclinical work uh, in my lab, but even uh, uh, more than that, they now find in natural history uh, work uh, uh, for this disease at MJH as well. Um, and uh, with support, of course, of um, uh, other organizations. Uh, very engaged uh, community, very active patients, advocacy groups are uh, the key element of this type of research. So in, in, in this space, uh, patients quite often, not only the uh, central piece and the uh, subject of the research, we also hope they will be ultimately the, the beneficiary of what we're doing. But quite often, they also play a role of benefactor and um, driving force uh, in the finding source of, of uh, this research efforts. And I would also highlight here another project in my lab in another foundation. And so this is the project that is aiming on designing AV-based gene therapy strategy for another ultra-rare neurologic uh, disease that is called BPAN, beta propeller protein associated neurodegeneration, and then going to, back to my background, so this is autophagy disease, also related to lysosomal function and the uh, cellular um, uh, overlaps with the cellular pathways. Uh, so this disease is uh, uh, described only in 2012, and there is this uh, patient uh, organization called Don't Forget Morgan, uh, run by uh, Kelly and Christina. Unfortunately, I see that um, something happened with Christina's uh, picture on the slide, um, uh, who are uh, just, uh, you know, tirelessly working to um, build research community and uh, uh, kind of pave the way to the uh, clinical trials in this disease as well. So through their efforts and funding programs, they built up, uh, this network of researchers who we are very closely now collaborating with. And it's been just a wonderful, you know, wonderful experience uh, uh, being a part of this community as well. Um, and so, uh, finally, uh, all the hard work in my lab uh, is being done uh, by uh, this group of um, highly motivated, very dedicated, and very smart uh, ladies, who I am endlessly grateful uh, to. And uh, down below is the um, list of my uh, finding sources. Thank you very much. Grishik and each of our presenters for sharing more about your lab and your experiences in working with patient groups. I want to encourage our audience to submit questions um, as we begin our discussion portion of this session. Um, you know, as patient groups, having come from the patient community myself, as patient groups begin to consider their involvement in treatment development, the early questions are always, how do we get started? How do we connect with a researcher to move forward a potential treatment? And so I really um, appreciate you all sharing how, how the work happens in your lab, how you make those connections, how things began. Um, and I want to start with um, a, a simple question. Um, I'd like to know how you all chose to go into research and why you made this choice, why you love your work, and follow up with, um, and if you could change one thing about it, what would you change? Uh, well, I guess I can kick us off and get us started. Um, 
So I actually have a younger brother um, with cerebral palsy, and it's actually quite severe for him. So I grew up uh, in a family where we were dealing with trying to manage his day-to-day -day care with his symptoms. Um, I would go to his physical therapy appointments with him, his doctor appointments with him. And so I became very interested in understanding how the human body works, but also when it's not working properly, how do, can we fix that? What can we do? Um, what can be done to help patients and families that are dealing with some of these challenging diseases. Um, so then moving forward into college, I focused on biology. However, um, it, for graduate school, I moved into neuroscience because I found I really loved studying the brain and understanding how that controls pretty much everything the body does. Um, and so, you know, I got my degree um, from a basic science standpoint, which I really loved doing the research, but after I got my PhD, I realized I really wanted to move into a position where I felt like my research was having a more immediate impact on someone's life, as opposed to potentially in a few years, our research findings could be used for therapy. And then to that end, I moved into doing my postdoctoral training with Dr. Gray, where the focus was the development of gene therapies. And that was actually my first opportunity where I was able to interact directly with patients and foundations who had the disorders or the diseases that I was actively working on. And that's just incredibly motivating and really helps to push forward. Working as hard as we do, I think Dr. Wen did an excellent job <laughs> trying to bullet point, you know, <laughs> what we do and you can't even capture all that within it, but it's for a great purpose. And so that's definitely the motivation. Yeah, I imagine, I imagine meeting the patient groups and, and meeting the, the patients themselves um, that level of um, compassion, empathy, and understanding is a great motivator in your labs each and every day. Yeah, Dr. Grishik, Dr. Dave, Dan, would you like to? Yeah, uh, I don't know if we need to keep the same order, but okay, since I'm talking, I'm gonna go ahead. Um, <laughs> so for me um so i grew up in a school where there were people that had some mental uh um, issue let's call it like this and uh i got very early being their mentor in that school and when i discovered um cell biology chromosome during my high school later on i was like wow this is fascinating then I went through different type of job. I'm like, I want a job that is stimulating my brain, but also bringing back what I can offer to people and, and help them. So then I went to a uh, university working on uh, um, basic science for quite a while. And then I'm like, that doesn't fit what I want to achieve. And so I switched, and that's why during my PhD, I went to a medical school, uh, not to get an MD degree, but just to work and interact with patients and how can I help them? Uh, like you train uh, people when you teach people and stuff like this. So that's where my motivation is coming from. Great. I love to hear that. Dr. Grishik. Uh, thank you, Sharon. So I, 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 uh, it all, I mean, uh, everything that Dr. Bailey and Dr. Wayne all said resonates with me too. So, but mm -hmm. I would like to focus probably on, uh, the thing that, um, kind of drives me in, um, what I'm doing. And that's really the possibility to make an impact. And I think, um, this very high and unmet need, uh, on, on uh, the patient side, I think this is what really kind of, um pushes you uh, to do something that I don't know sometimes even doesn't feel possible to do you know like it's like a lot of barriers right so we have a lot of barriers in moving those programs but I think ultimately very high unmet need what uh, makes it happen uh, on on different levels on the level of funding the level of um, resources the level of just internal kind of motivation to go step after step um, 
but uh, you also asked what we love about the, the, the job. And I think the biggest factor um, for me in continuing in this kind of career path is diversity of tasks. And um, yes, yeah, so uh, Dr. Wayne listed some of them. So it's it's never boring, right? So you're jumping from from writing and teaching and doing animal work uh, and kind of handling animals and and doing all sorts of stuff. And uh, it's yeah, it's very diverse and it's you know you you can plan days differently and never get bored. And um, I think there are also things that make this uh, job very hard. And from the things that make it really hard, I would name two. So one is the uh, um, fear of failure. Because we're doing things and we do not want, even so science overall um, kind of assumes a lot of failures on the way. Working in this translational research, you don't want to fail. Like, you know, people waiting for you to succeed. So that's very pressing. And then working in um, neurodegenerative diseases makes time your enemy, right? So we always work against time. And so that's another factor that kind of stress inducing. And if I can change that, I would change this. I'm right there with you. Um, you know, I've wondered so many times in my background in supporting um, early research, um, how you deal every day with the fact that you know you're racing against the clock on behalf of a patient community and that time is their enemy. As much as the disease, time is also their enemy and you are their champion trying to move something forward on their behalf. It's a lot to take on. Um, and I've always been appreciative about that. And yes, I always also find the science to be fascinating. I'm sure I didn't have the science chops to move to move it forward. I was um, not much science in my background, but but it is. I find it fascinating. So I, I can imagine that it's easy to get up every day and go to work, um, knowing what you're contributing. So thank you for that. Um, Another question, and again, I'm encouraging the audience, if you have questions, something you've wondered about working with um, researchers, please um, share, share those questions with us. Um, so my next question is, um, and I'm not sure this is a really good question because you've shared that you're working on multiple disease states at the same time. So um, uh, Dr. Bailey, you shared that early on, some of the things you're, you continue to work on, you started as a postdoc. Um, and then of course you've added new, pro, you know, new projects along the way. How do you decide, how do each of you decide what project to take on? You know, what is that factor that drives you in a certain direction? For a certain um, state. Go ahead, Dr. Uh, Bailey. So I would say for, especially our pediatric disorders, actually what we oftentimes choose to work on is where the need is. So when we actually have foundations for patient advocates that approach us directly, ask us to work on a disease where they're expressing need, um, showing that they're able to pull together a patient community, particularly for rare disorders, that can be a challenge because there's oftentimes we need to know the patients are there as well as we may need resources from the patient, um, as Dr. Wen had gone through, like cell culture samples, patient samples, as Dr. Grishuk had mentioned, you know, in terms of better understanding a disease, so you could better treat it. Um, but also part of it is, you know, is gene therapy appropriate for that disease? Um, is the strategies we use in our lab, are they appropriate for that disease? And so I think finding a good fit between the lab as well as the disease and where areas of expertise lie is also a critical factor, you know, or is that PI or is that not suited to work on that disease? And likewise, oftentimes the PI asks themselves that, you know, is this within my wheelhouse? Would it make sense for us to work on it? Or can you refer them to another gene therapist or another um, expert who may be better suited? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, how, um, Dr. Wynn, maybe you could answer this question. How do patient advocates find you? I mean, how do they, how do they um, 
determine who to go to first. And I'm and I do appreciate, you know, that Dr. Bailey has shared that sometimes you say there's someone else who could take this and you help patients find that correct path. But how do patient advocates get started and find you? Well, I mean, there is several layer to, to that question um, and several answer. Um, I would say usually it starts with how well you advertise, uh, not advertise, well, how well you communicate your science and what you're doing and mm -hmm. uh, what type of um, skill and background you have. Uh, then most of the time they find you through uh, internet <laughs> as well. Uh, they just type, they just discover, unfortunately, that their kid has a disease and they just type it online. And if you're good with uh, networking and uh, advertise, I'm not advertising, but um, having the right keyword about your lab, you're going to pop out and then they will reach out to you. The third one is having very close interaction with clinician. It's one, it's a very key things. And the last one is when you go to conference and you present your work, just to buy a patient table or anything that help to promote this uh, type of interaction. Mm -hmm. Dr. Grishuk, um, it, are there certain times of the year? Um, how, you know, what is the, the, the process for moving? As we, you've all three addressed the process for moving this forward, but are there certain times of year that um, groups that are trying to get started in um, in treatment development that you would start, that you consider new proposals, or does it happen throughout um, whenever you're contacted? When's the best time for them to get you? Yes, thank you. So I think the advantage of working with, uh, you know, foundations and patient advocacy groups is that you can be flexible. So uh, as soon as you identify the research, I think that, you know, the uh, agreements, proposals, reviews can be done in a timely uh, manner and uh, it really kind of under control of those organizations. So unlike uh, NIH uh, finding that has, you know, like uh, specific dates for submission, reviews and uh, cycles of uh, um, kind of working on your um, grant applications, the uh, um, work with foundations is flexible, and I think there is a lot of advantages to this, and I think this is what ultimately allows it to move quicker. Mm -hmm. how, about how long is, you know, once patient advocates, um, Dr. Bailey has addressed some of the things that they need to bring to the table to move things mm -hmm. forward, but um, so when you're deciding to work with a new patient group, how do you help them understand moving forward? You know, they're bringing things to the table, but you also have to address this path forward that includes timelines and milestones. And, you know, when will you need to bring additional stakeholders into the project? And, and then, of course, the funding needed to move the project forward. Um, how do you help them move down that path? And also about how long does that period of time take? Mm -hmm. You know, because patients are always saying, you know, I, they wanted it yesterday. And, That's and, it, and, and, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. That's right. Yeah, so I think um, uh, uh, my answer to this would be that, you know, quite often um, uh, uh, the foundation already has established um, process of <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. contracting researchers for the uh, mm -hmm. research projects and mm -hmm. they either have established procedure for um, grant applications review and uh, some timelines um, and other foundations have uh, more established you know a pass uh, than others so I think communicating between you know like within the network of patient advocacy groups and really uh, uh, kind of benefiting from working and uh, established and working models can help the process but uh, ultimately it comes to creating a grant application so on the researcher side so grant application is the document that um, let um, the foundation know uh, your plans in terms of research goals and how they will be achieved, budgets and the timelines. So all is included uh, into the grant application that is being reviewed by uh, independent uh, reviewers, which are experts in the field. And then ultimately, um, 
agreement between foundation and the organizations we all working uh, in uh, would be the, the the next level of uh, uh, kind of securing that funding and enabling the work okay all right thank you yeah, I'm yeah. just gonna add to yeah, sorry, I'm just going to add to that. I think one of the key factors is to be honest and have a clear communication and set up expectation and a realistic timeline. And but keep reminding them that it's not like you go, you have to fix your car, you bring it to the mechanic, it's just change a piece and you get it back within that time frame. Unfortunately, as we mentioned earlier, usually 90 percent of, uh, of the experiment are fake so even so we are trying to be very um careful about when we give timeline to patient or to anyone anyway uh there is there is a need to make sure that the patient understand that it might not happen this way unfortunately even mm -hmm. so I, I i do understand they need it yesterday but we're doing what we can mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, um, it, we, we, you know, we talk about alignments and then when you're moving forward a, a project such as this, a realignment, when things don't happen as you thought they might and then you realign, how do you manage that? How do you address that with um, patient groups who come to you? So I think Dr. Wine had said it well about setting um, trying to set expectations up front. Um, and I think part of it is, you know, on the part of the PI is helping to educate the foundations on the process, what is needed at each step before you move to the next step. Um, also, what resource, resources are available at the on start of the project and what need to be developed. Because that, because that can be a really time consuming when you need to develop resources. And by resources, um, an example would be an animal model of the disease. So if you have a rare disease, you need an animal model that mimics aspects of that disease so that when you give it potential treatment, you have something to measure that tells you how effective that treatment is working. But if that model doesn't exist at the start of the disease, then one needs to be made. And that can be quite time consuming because that in itself, especially, you know, you're talking about making a moss, mouse model, a rat model, those are living creatures that take time to breed, to develop, and then you have to see if they're successful. And then if they're not successful, then you have to try again. Um, and so that can be areas where projects can take longer you know, versus some programs may see other ones and like that one made it quickly to the clinic. Well, if there was a pre-existing model or resources that were already in place that can help accelerate. How often, how often do you, Dr. Wynn, how often do you communicate with your pa the patient groups, organizations whom you work? Okay, that's a tough one, this one. Um... So I'm going to answer by like, two ways. Um, often, very often. <laughs> um, but um, I think what we as PI need to establish with the patient that there should be a boundary. Like, the, I mean, we some most of the time, unfortunately, give them personal number and we keep texting them until midnight because they are in stress, which is understandable. We want to be there for them. But we also <laughs> we also have a life too. So uh, I think that uh, one thing that I realized over the years that I mean, it's good to, to have a very often communication with them. But it's also good to uh, put a limit because if I'm distracted by answering you all the time, then the research is not moving forward. I, I don't know if uh, um, Dr. Bailey and Dr. Grish uh, have a different opinion about that, but uh, that's my overall impression the last couple of years. Yeah, I, 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 
Mm-hmm. How do you, Doctor? So, Doctor Grishik, how do you address that in your um, in your um, as you build a relationship with a patient group? So, from the kind of more systematic point of view, I would split those communications into formal communications and more of informal communications. So, in formal communications, there are grant reports and uh, presentations that you give. And so, the grant reports usually uh, twice a year. So, like at least in 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 my experience working with patients' organization, they ask you to uh, report uh, with uh, achieve, achievement of major milestones twice a year and so but this is kind of a written report that I'm doing and uh, there are also uh, presentations in uh, uh, there were study clubs or uh, collaborators networks uh, with updates uh, but then uh, especially when the program moves more into kind of translational path those communications are endless, right? So and so it's just very hard to count them. And it could be every day and they're joining a lot of meetings. And it's, you know, like it's it's a it's a it's a flow of communication. <laughs> so it's very hard. And, and uh, most of this uh, is uh, very uh, kind of needed and productive communication with foundations. So, I mean, they, they have to be an active part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would, um, patients want to be a part and they want to contribute as much as they can, Mm -hmm. as much as they can. Dr. Bailey, do you have any comment on that? Uh, I mean, I would agree with both what Dr. Wynn and Dr. Grishuk said in Mm -hmm. that I find um, with my own programs, typically in the earlier phases, those communications may be less frequent. And that's because if you're developing models or just getting the research up and running, that can take Mm -hmm. more time. However, as you move along the process and your programs are becoming more advanced and then there is more to share, as well as now there needs to be more planning on the next steps in terms of being able to translate this program, then typically those communications become more frequent. So some of them may be through monthly meetings, uh, again, formal reports can be effective, um, but then also just for you know foundations and partners. The more, as Dr. Wen said, the more often they request to speak with you and want to talk about it, it is then less time you're actually able to put towards the project. Um, and so it's sometimes it's difficult to find that balance um, because, of course, you know the foundations are invested, the patients are mm-hmm. invested. Mm-hmm. And so you do want to keep them updated. Um, but it's also, you need to make sure you get researchers time to be able to do the research. Right. And also understand that you have multiple projects going on in your labs at the same time. Um, I'm going to jump back a little um, with more of the emotions in, in, in your chosen career. Um, I imagine it can be heart-wrenching at times to hear patient advocates share their stories and their need for help and hope. Um, How do you maintain a sense of optimism and balance when speaking with patient advocates about different disorders and diseases? And this is not only in the beginning as you're, you know, potentially um, you're, you're either potentially building a relationship or starting in those early days of the relationship with the patient organization, but throughout um, the relationship with with the organization that is providing support and hoping um, to drive forward successful science on behalf of their disease. Um, How do you maintain that optimism and balance in what you do every day? I can probably start and say just that for many diseases, um, even uh, now in 2022, uh, the fact that uh, there is a research group who works on the disease is already a huge factor for optimism. It's, and, and so because uh, it, it, it could be ups and downs, but the fact that there is someone who works on this disease, I think is already huge. And if the foundation came to this point, uh, it's a huge achievement already by default. Um, so I think reminding uh, um, this uh, yourself is important. Um, 
So I don't know if uh, if Rachel and Nicholas, you can add anything to this. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I, I do have um, uh, troubles, you know, feeling optimistic at times, but <laughs> then I think it's um, nothing nothing different than for anyone else. You 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 find your <laughs> internal mechanism. Sometimes external help for this. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I, I will just say, I mean, it's like, it's to me, uh, uh, I like to make the analogy depend on the, uh, the students that you are training. Some people are more receiving of, I mean, you need to adapt your relationship, basically, depending on who you're talking to. And I found the same with patients. Uh, some of them, they like to be optimistic and they want to keep you feeding them with optimism, but you still need to be careful and uh, say, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's promising, but yeah, <laughs> it's still going to take a bit of time, unfortunately. And some, they, if you're too optimistic with them, uh, they start to be angry at you when you don't deliver what uh, you say you're going to deliver. So uh, you, you really need to find this um, I mean, I'm an empathic person. I feel the, the people, and I re, and, and adapt my uh, interaction with them based on that. Um, so I guess I would add, you know, so my personal motivation, I guess, would be like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at, one bite at a time? So you know, it's a daunting task, but I, for myself, what I have found is important, and also important to remind my staff that are working on these projects is to keep moving forward. Um, even when we come up against roadblocks or an experiment maybe doesn't work well, it doesn't mean it's an absolute failure and you know you yourself have failed either yourself or the family, but you need to learn from it take a step back and find a way around. And I think in interacting with families, I think it's important that you are able to convey to them that you are trying and, you know, and that you show I'm not giving up on you or your program and that I will do what's what I can that's reasonable to help you move this forward. Um, and, you know, part of I showed I'm working on many different programs. Not all those are at the preclinical level anymore. Like we finished the preclinical studies and now we're at that phase of trying to get into a clinical trial but you still work with the families, you still work with the foundations, with partners to find a way forward. And so I think as long as you continue to work with each other, then that's when you can give some assurances to the family that, you know, someone is trying on their program and they're giving it what they can. And they, you know, as a researcher, I will do what I can to try to help find a way forward, even if I am not the one to move it forward, you know, can we find you a partner who can then get you to the next step? I think I would have any of the three of you on my team any day of the week. Thank you. Before we end today, um, we do have a question from our audience. And the question is, um, how successful do you think gene therapy has been so far? And we've seen recent approvals. Um, so the question is, how successful is gene therapy, in your opinion? All right, I'm going to start on this one. Uh, so it's, uh, it's like the Swift Army knife that I show you. It's a very loaded question. Uh, it has been uh, successful in different program. And unfortunately, there is, we've, you probably have seen uh, uh, some deaths uh, recently whether they are related to the gene therapy, whether they are related to the purity of the vector injected, whether the dose was selected right, or whether the method of uh, injection of the, the virus was the appropriate one. And whether, what type of disease are we talking about? Because if you already, for example, have a liver disease and um, you inject a high dose of vector yeah, I mean, it's not going to be as successful uh, or worst case scenario. So it's it's very hard to answer your question, to be honest. Uh, I would say if all the necessary safety step has been taken, uh, it's safe. Uh, and 
successful wise i mean time will tell but i will say in it's hard to put a number i don't want to put a number in fact so uh i would say probably 90 percent of the time it's it's okay but do you expect to have a, a clear strong impact on the disease that unfortunately your kid or your family has it's very it's gonna take time to, for us to tell but it's definitely better than not having anything. I mean, I'm gonna take the example and stop there um, about uh, this antisense sequence that we are used uh, for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where people were saying that, oh, but it's only bring one or two percent back of the protein. But guess what? For the patient, it made a, it makes them believe, like it's a hope. Someone has worked on the disease as we were discussed. And it's still better than nothing. So with that, I'm going to leave my other two colleagues to comment. Good answer. Dr. Bailey, would you like to? Sure. Um, so yeah, exactly. How successful is gene therapy? Well, we have seen that for some diseases, it can be very successful, that it can be life altering. And that's why there's FDA approved drugs now for, F for gene therapies. And there's actually a high, uh, well, Hi to us being a relatively new field number of regulatory approved therapies um keeping in mind that there's different ways to do gene therapy there's the vector mediated methods there's rna deliveries there's cell therapy in vivo ex vivo so is it successful for every disease no it's not that we've seen in the clinic but part of that is the technology may not be there yet so depending on what the needs of the disease are we may not have found the best way to approach it with gene therapy. Um, the delivery is being improved as well as our knowledge of vectors and ways to make these drugs. They're continuously being improved. And so I think what's important is for the community to realize this is still experimental in many aspects that we are still learning. And as scientists, we continually strive to improve the technologies that are available so that we can make better treatments. So it's important that we actually keep doing clinical trials because we need to learn. There's only so much that we can do in animal models and although we can rescue a mouse, um, we need to learn from humans what is the best way to rescue a human. Okay. Thank you for that. Dr. Grishuk, would you like to respond? I would like just to echo and say that, you know, in, in, in uh, the, there are extremely successful examples with approved drugs. So Genzma is one of them, right? So, and so sometimes it just sets very high and sometimes false expectations for other diseases and other programs. We also know a lot of struggles in other programs that do not get to uh, approval, you know, in a timely way and getting through kind of levels of complications. So I think it's a great technology. I think uh, it is absolutely kind of a revolutionary idea for the medicine and there is a lot of room to grow for this technology in the in the in the in the coming years. Yes. Well thank you for that. Thank you for answering that question. That was um uh, thank you for that. That was a, a difficult question. I had many different answers, but it was you answered it so well. Um I want to thank you all as we end this session. Um, I want to thank our speakers for sharing, sharing your time today to talk about the work in your labs and your work with patient groups. It's been really helpful to hear specific examples and your experience and how you've worked with these patient groups and other stakeholders in the space and how patient groups can best work with you to make a difference in researching and developing treatments for various disorders. I also would like to thank those of you in the audience for joining our Lunch and Learn. I hope you've enjoyed hearing from our researchers today who've been participating in the discussion. And we'll be, we'll be posting this recorded session on the patient education website early next week and we'll notify you when it's available. Um, I hope you'll feel free to broadly share the recording of this session and others that are also available on the website. Um, our next Lunch and Learn will take place on Thursday, November 17th, and the focus will be navigating the patient-provider conversation. 
And you're gonna have the chance to hear the experiences of both the patient advocate, caregiver, and the provider while navigating through the various options available to the patient. Um, you can begin registering for this session on the ASGCT patient education site next week. So register for that when you're online looking for uh, to listen to this recording. Um, please add our next event to your calendar and plan to join. Until then, again, thanks to each of our speakers, Dr. Rachel Bailey, Dr. Nicholas Quinn, and Dr. Yulia Grishuk. And um, I hope that each of you and uh, our audience will enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having Thank us. You.